Welcome to City Week, ladies and gentlemen. Today we're sitting down with the county historian Clark Johnson as we prepare to look at the month of February and celebrate Black History Month. Clark, welcome to the show. Today. Thank you, Alton. Well, you know, we're sitting here and we you know, want to start talking about, you know, kind of black history and everything of that nature. But before we get into what we're here to talk about today, I want to just uh, get a little bit of words from you about your role as the, the county historian and the interim director of the Legacy Museum. So tell us a little bit about your role, if you don't mind. Well, what I do is uh, basically at the archives uh, because it's the Troop County Historical Society and they have a museum and an archives. And of course the archives, we store records for the city, the county, and the school board. But we also have a library where people can do local history and, and genealogy research. And as county historian, that's my major function. But okay. in the museum, my major function has been since we haven't had a curator for quite some time, has been to help uh, put up exhibits and uh, come up with things to fill out exhibits. Okay. All right, well but I, I help people who come in. Of course, I can pull a, a marriage record that somebody needs or a school record or a court record. But I also answer most of the emails that deal with genealogy or local history. Okay. Well, very good. And, you know, you're talking about genealogy. I kind of jotted that down there. And, and as we enter into the month of black history, how far back, and, and I don't want to put you on the spot, just guesstimating, were there a lot of records kept for African Americans way back, or what's the furthest back you've seen? Well, most government records are geared toward individuals, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. um, and so people who weren't free, there aren't many records generated for them, but um, we have been able to find quite a few references to uh, slaves by their name um, unfortunately, you know, the census records, mm -hmm. which is one of the largest tools that people can use for doing genealogy, they don't start listing everybody in a household by name until 1850. Prior to that, they only listed the head of the household, and then they would give the number of free white males, free white females, slave males, and enslaved females. Mm -hmm. But then they would also, they had a, a column where they listed free persons of color. Oh. And so there are quite a few that we find in the 1830 and 1840 census in Troop County, but we only have their numbers. Okay. But going into old court documents, um, we can find like there are actually deeds where uh, people have been given away because they were slaves, you know, mm -hmm. or sold. Uh, so there are actually deeds with their names on them. Um, Perhaps the very earliest record of, of anybody black by name is 1829, which is only the second year the county was uh, up. Right. But they were in an estate record where a man had died and his slaves were listed by name. So we have that document that's probably the very earliest mention of black people by their name by is 1829. Right. And then we had, like I said, there were free Persons of color was actually the way they okay. expressed it. Uh, free blacks uh, is, is that early as well, because they're in the 1830 census. The very first whose names we have, you know, which gives them a, gives them a face and, mm -hmm. and humanizes them yes, to right. have a name, uh, is an 1831 petition by a free woman of color named Patsy King and her whole family. She and all her children were free, but even though even though they were free, if they had property, they had to have a guardian. And she was petitioning for someone to be appointed her guardian, 1831. 1831. And what's, talk about tracing people, remarkably, um, in 1850, Patsy King is still living and still in Troop County. And in 1853, she needed a new guardian, and so there's another petition for her. But her children had all kind of moved away. But using the census, I found where her children moved. And I actually traced that whole family from 1831 up into the 1860s. The whole family, all her children, moved over to Augusta, Georgia, oh for some reason. And I found them there in the 1860 census, oh still all living with each other and next door to each other. Oh my. And, and that was really, yeah, it's, it's a hard thing to do. But sometimes you have success with that sort of trace. So, 
little detective you are there, aren't you? Yeah, well, that's really, genealogy is detective, <laughs> detective work. work. That's right. And it's kind of like doing a crossword puzzle Absolutely. sometimes. You, you just have to look for the pieces. Keep and, digging in. And, and, you know, talking about that, and I know that you all have an exhibit that's coming up. And, and, <coughs> and as we celebrate Black History Month, I know that a lot of times when we talk about black history and we talk particularly about LaGrange, Troop County, the most noted name comes up, and that is Horace King. And, and I think it's uh, clear for us to say that Patsy King, no relation, no relation to, Horace to Horace King, King right? Just the coincidence. The coincidence. They had last that same name. name. Okay. And a lot of times, like I said, we, we want to talk about Horace King. He's a great, you know, bridge builder, very well known throughout the southeastern, you know, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. But I think the title of this exhibit that you you all are putting up is Lifting More Voices. Lifting More Voices, okay. yes. Talk and the exhibit up. is up right now. Okay, all uh, right. It, we finished all the little details yesterday. Okay. We've already had several people come in to see it. Talk and a little bit about it. Who like it, but um, the King, the Horace King family are also in this exhibit. Okay. But this exhibit is not about them. It's about pointing out that they weren't the only. Mm -hmm. uh, black family of achievement mm -hmm. in Troop County before or after uh, 1865, okay. which, you know, that's the date that freedom right. is emancipation. Emancipation mm -hmm. is, is general all over. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we, we have this exhibit to show focus on particularly the wonderful achievements that black people made after 1865, but we do have a small uh, part of the exhibit focuses on before 1865 and we have some of those documents that I was talking about where we find black people mentioned by name from mm -hmm. court records. Okay. Um, and it, it's funny like uh, one of them is that a slave had been allowed to use a house for his own business but it's not the slave who has tried, it's his master for letting him do it. Oh, really? Yeah, and another one was allowed to conduct business for himself off his master's property. And the, again, it's the master who gets indicted and tried for that, not the slave. For allowing. But oh. it gives us their names, and it just gives us a little look into, you know, mm -hmm. some of the things various that things that we don't think about in slave life that, that, that that slaves were allowed to earn income of their own on the side, mm -hmm, and sometimes mm -hmm. they were able to purchase their freedom with Absolutely. that money. Uh, and you were talking very rare occurrence, but still those things happen. And so we have a, a section of the exhibit is about slave life as seen in court documents, and, and it's all about Troop County. It's, this is not a general, mm -hmm. this is specific to Troop, Troop County, County, the okay. entire exhibit. Then we have a large section in there that discusses and talks about and gives documents for uh, blacks who were free before 1865 okay. and like Patsy King and her family that's all in there but uh, one of my favorite people is Giles Wilkinson mm. and he was a free man long before the war he and his wife Viney and they were large property owners he owned 16 acres of land over on the east side of LaGrange but his home place was four acres and his house was right in the forks of what is today Broad Street and Country Club Road Oh right there where that little park is in the fork of those two roads, uh -huh. that was where he lived, right near Red Line Alley. Right. And um, <clears throat> Giles Wilkerson, uh, we have deeds and we have a map. Uh, some citizens in the 1920s had, had recreated the map of LaGrange for the year 1860 and his household is shown on there. And, oh my. Uh, now, let me ask name. you. Let me, you were saying and freed slaves and you know and, and the achievements. What was the occupation of most of these individuals back during that? Well, time we don't have a good grip on the occupations before, but they're probably the same. They okay. were um, some farmed. Giles Wilkerson, you know, was a farmer. Okay. But uh, some of them uh, were carpenters or, or brick masons okay. or skilled craftsmen, and. Um, Rounding out that segment before 1865, we have copies and uh, also transcripts because you know the old handwriting is not always that easy <laughs> to, read, to read. That's right. Of, of the documents that brought freedom. Okay. And so we have the Emancipation Proclamation, a beautiful copy of that. We have the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution. And so that rounds out that section prior to 1865. Very good. And then the rest of the exhibit focuses on, like I said, the amazing achievements done by the freedmen mm -hmm. from 1865 on. It's the early churches, 
we have about the early schools um, and some of the teachers and ministers but uh, also what a lot of people may not know is we have actually um, three four uh, historically black cemeteries in town mm -hmm. and so we've, we've traced the development of those and, and the dates and uh, we have photographs we have pictures of places and people mm -hmm. and maps and artifacts um, we have some beautiful handmade items that uh, were made by slave craftsmen oh, okay. Um, okay. <coughs> and all this can, is, is on exhibit now at it's the on museum. exhibit now Tell and them this, the is, this is not just something right. we've done for Black History Month. Okay. This exhibit is going to be up through the middle of September. September, okay. And tell them the hours that, that people can come in and visit. Clark. You can come in Monday through Friday from 9 to 5. All right. But just let me tell you, it will take more than an hour to just go through the exhibit uh -huh. uh, to begin with, but this is an exhibit that you'll want to come back several times because it'll take that much time to absorb all that we've put in this Absolutely. exhibit. And, and the, the, the other thing you said, these are all Troop County This residents. is all about Troop, Troop County, County people and their accomplishments, okay. yes. Okay, very this, good. This is Troop County history that, mm -hmm. that we're putting up. Any charge, like any, any other time, is there any we charge? We are free. There's okay. no charge for admission. Okay, very Absolutely good. Absolutely none. Now, and I know some people, you know, work, you said nine <coughs> to five. Are you all particularly open or anytime open on Saturdays? Right now, we are open the first and third Saturdays of every month mm -hmm. from 10 to 4. Okay. But sometimes we have to close on a Saturday, particularly like, well, if it falls on July, the, the first weekend in July sometimes. That's right. And um, we like for people to call okay. and check to make sure that we're going to be open on, on a Saturday. But it's okay. usually the first and third Saturdays from 10 to 4. Okay. And they can call us. Of course, we're in the book, but 706-884-1828. Easy enough to remember, isn't it? 1828 was... 1828, yeah. that's right, absolutely. Well, Clark, this is quite exciting, and, and I hope that the residents of Troop County will come out, not just the African Americans, but all. I think the more we Everyone know about each other... Everyone should be interested other, in this, absolutely. because it's great Troop County history. But um, we also have a, a segment about Cannonville, which oh. some people may not know was a community founded by uh, William Sherman Cannon, uh, who was a black man who ran a newspaper, but he got up to teaching mm -hmm. and he started a, a number of enterprises that became so widespread that he actually had to move to Atlanta to handle all his business. And But he promoted this town and it was just for blacks. Oh my. Uh, he, he found it as a black community. And you know, we have course several neighborhoods that we think of as black neighborhoods in LaGrange now but historically the first one was Thomastown Thomas which was okay. right where Ridley Avenue ran into um, Moody Bridge Road mm -hmm. and it was named for Kate and Wilkins Thomas who lived there their house sat right where uh, the school is now that's Hope Academy mm -hmm. okay. but originally the school built there was named Thomastown School for them as well okay um, so we have a little segment on that we have a uh, part on our earliest black doctors and lawyers some people just don't realize we had a black doctor in LaGrange in 1881 oh and my. a black lawyer in 1883 okay Charles Lindsay was the lawyer and, and uh, Dr. Ramsey Edward Ramsey, Ramsey was the first doctor, Hi. and he was followed shortly thereafter by Dr. Epps, whose beautiful Victorian right. home still on stands Hamilton on the Road. corner of Fannin and Hamilton That's Road. Right. Okay. Um, we have that home in there too. But Dr. Uh, Ramsey's son-in-law, Dr. John Henry Jordan, uh, also practiced medicine here. Then he moved to Noonan and founded his own hospital. And we actually have some furniture from Dr. Jordan's home. And Dr. Jordan was married to Dr. Ramsey's daughter. And uh, <coughs> oh my. we have uh, pictures of them. We have a small section on, on military because a lot of people do not know that, you know, and this was unusual for a small southern town, mm -hmm. you know. To have his own military. In 1880, right. uh, 1878, uh -huh. uh, they had a black militia in town and a second one in 1884. And they, they were just like the white militia. Uh, it was sort of like a, just a, a National mm -hmm. Guard unit, mm -hmm. basically, mm -hmm. is what it became. But the local militia, they would serve as uh, 
extra police when there were large crowds in town or the circus came to town or, or any day like that. They would work as firemen if a big fire broke out okay. and they were exempt from street tax for doing those services. Let me ask a question now, were they uh, accepted in all of the communities or just particularly to the black communities? Well, um, you know, because they, they drilled in town, they held suppers at the courthouse. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. The event center in town back in those days was called Sterling Hall mm -hmm. up until 1881 when the Truitts bought it and uh, renovated it and turned it into what they, they named it Truett Opera House. Uh -huh. But everybody's events, black and white, they had suppers, dances, balls, um, hmm, lectures, uh -huh. were either held in the courthouse or in uh, Sterling Hall or Truett Opera House. Now and the courthouse you're speaking about, is that <clears throat> when it was up on the square at that it time? It was in the center of the square. Okay. okay. <clears throat> and strangely enough, the, the courthouse that stood from 1828 till 1902 mm -hmm. uh, was actually built by a black mason named Ross Cameron oh my. in okay. 1828. And uh, he went on to do other things like uh, the original part of Smith Hall at LaGrange College in 1860 okay. and we know several houses he did but uh, also Sterling Hall it Sterling Hall stood where the flagpole park is now Sterling, on the okay. south I was going to ask that question corner, in a moment okay. on the southeast corner it was a three-story building okay there were offices and shops on the first floor and offices on the second floor and the whole third floor was a giant auditorium with a stage and everything so that's where they had the dances Sterling and lectures Hall. and parties and and, and things like that. And all this can be shown on these displays that are currently up All of this is in the okay. museum and um, there were even some black businesses and that's another section where we okay. focus on the development of, of black business community mm -hmm. uh, after 1865 mm -hmm. and um, but back to Sterling Hall because you know sometimes I, I <laughs> get off on a tangent. <laughs> okay. um, the building and we have a beautiful picture of it uh, was renovated and beautiful two-story porch added to it by a black a contractor named Lewis Gill. Mm -hmm. and, um, a two-story porch on Sterling on Hall? On the front of Sterling, Sterling Hall, Hall okay. yeah. So we have okay. that photograph okay. and that was in the 1880s. So it seems like African Americans have contributed a lot to the Troop County uh, back Absolutely. in the days, back in the 1800s, you know, as far as the buildings are concerned, schools, education <laughs> is concerned, even the craftsmanship uh, because as, you, as you, we were talking before we came on, because it was very few uh, people, uh, Caucasian you said, that were actually right. craftsmen, right? Well, the key to this is that Troop County in 1860 was the fourth wealthiest county in the state of Georgia. Whoa. And of course that wealth was largely based on slaveholding mm -hmm. because Troop County was the fifth largest slaveholding county in the state of Georgia. Now what that meant really was that you didn't have a class of white people who were tradespeople right. and workers and laborers. Mm -hmm. There was no work for them. Mm -hmm. And all of our skilled artisans, the craftsmen, mm -hmm. the masons, the carpenters, the machinists even, right. the mechanics, the engineering work, as well as all the physical labor, was done by, by black people. Right. And so, you know, you see one of these beautiful old homes, we don't have very many of them left anymore, but you see one of them in town. It's not just a monument to the people who lived in it, mm -hmm. it's a monument to the people who built it. Yeah, that's because right. the beautiful hand-carved mantelpieces, the wainscoting, that was all done by black craftsmen. Hand. Hand-carved, uh, yes, right. absolutely. A lot of detailed, yeah. de uh, tedious work That's there. right. Mm -hmm. Okay, let, let me just ask yeah, a question. Uh, there, there was even a, an article in the LaGrange newspaper mm -hmm. as late as 1886. It said, there is not a skilled white carpenter in this town. <laughs> oh my. So, and of course, you know, you mentioned the King family. The, mm -hmm. the Kings are, are in this exhibit, but we're not focusing on right. them. We're focusing on total- Lifting more voices. Lifting more voices. More in, voices. In Troop County. And it, but they are in the exhibit, but you know, they moved here in 1872. Mm -hmm. And they moved here because they felt this was a place where race relations were very good. Of course, no place was perfect, but they right. were pretty good. Okay. Um, and part of that was because you didn't have a large uh, lower class white population, just to be honest with mm -hmm, you. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's the former slave owners who helped 
black people more than the federal government after 1865. Mm -hmm. They donated land, money, material to help build black churches and schools and they supported institutions. Mm -hmm. When the black militia would have a dinner, white people would attend to help raise money for their uniforms or right. something like that. Okay. Um, but also, Troop County, LaGrange, was the place that the first black fair in America was ever held, 1878. Oh my. You know, they used to have county fairs mm -hmm. around all over the, the country, and some places still do. Mm -hmm. um, but the first one, specifically for black people was in 1878 in LaGrange. In LaGrange. And it ran for several years. We have a big um, exhibit to that. Big part of that in okay. the exhibit too that that details all the goings on at the fair every year. Mm -hmm. And uh, they used the same fairgrounds that the white fair was held in. And of course, blacks and whites went to each fair. Uh, in fact, there's there's one place where a couple of black people even won premiums at the white fair. Okay. But uh, and one of the things that I think was cute was in the black fair in the horse races. That was the one thing the white people couldn't enter horses in the horse races at the black fair because they didn't think it was fair because they had <laughs> finer better horses horse and better, right. better bloodlines <laughs> that they'd had for years. Uh -huh. So that Absolutely. wasn't fair. So, but they could enter, whites could enter mules in the mule race. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, the slower animal, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let me ask you a question, Clark, as we get ready to close out. With this exhibit, and, and you have given, a, oh my God, a great synopsis of the things that are going to be, uh, that are on display there. If there's one thing that you would want visitors to take away from this, what is that one thing, or a couple of things, particularly? Well, I just want them, I, I would like for people to come and realize that um, we have a richer heritage than maybe we thought mm -hmm. we did, and, and we're trying at the museum and at the archives to bring this to light. Mm -hmm. And so we just hope everyone would come and appreciate that we have a great heritage, and it's all part of our heritage, mm -hmm. it's it's not you know compartmentalized, right? But this is just a segment of our history that uh, absolutely we haven't explored very well, perhaps in the past. But we're we're going to work on that. Um, we are having we have a small gallery in addition to this large gallery where okay. this exhibit is mm -hmm. that we can put up small, shorter term exhibits. Mm -hmm. And in July, we're going to put up an entire gallery on the Horace King family. Oh, okay. And, and so that will be joining this exhibit and it will go up in July and it'll stay up through September also. Okay. We, we had a, a banquet last year to, as a fundraiser for the Stark Society and it was timed so, so that it happened to be the 150th anniversary of the end of the war between the states. Mm -hmm. But um, particularly we focused on the group of women, you know, who marched out in the street right. to keep their homes from being burned <laughs> in, right. in April of 1865. Mm -hmm. And of course, the man who invaded LaGrange wasn't a house burner, but they didn't know that. <laughs> so that was sort of the theme of last year's banquet. And this year's banquet that we hope to have in August mm -hmm. uh, is going to be about Horace King and his family. Oh, okay. And so there'll be not only this exhibit that's up now, but there'll also be another gallery with Horace King, Horace King and his, and his family, family and all their remarkable achievements uh, in detail. Okay. That small gallery uh, is also going to be in March, there's going to be an exhibit for Women's History Month. And okay. again, it'll just be all about Troop County women mm -hmm. um, who have achieved and, and done remarkable things. Very good. Um, Very. In April and May, that gallery will be the 100th anniversary of Hills and Dales. And we'll be, we'll be doing mm -hmm. some things with them because they're celebrating the 100th anniversary of Hills and Dales Estate That's right. this year. It opened in 1916. So, um, A lot of great things going on there right. at the museum. Right? Well, Clark, I'm going to tell you, we could sit here and talk all afternoon. I have truly been enlightened by some of the tidbits that you've given me, and I'm definitely going to visit that exhibit. Great. But our time has escaped us okay. now. So I want to thank you very much for coming thank on the show today. Thank you for having me on. All right. And, and definitely want to make sure that everybody comes out and visit. And one, as we close, given that number one more time, that if they have questions or want to uh, ask additional information about the exhibits and stuff. 706-884-1828. And if you'd like to bring a group, call and, and we can okay. arrange that. But call and double check to make sure I, that we're going to be open Saturdays. But we're always open 9 to 5, Monday okay. through Friday, except holidays. Except holidays. <laughs> All right. Clark, well, we thank you so much. Love to have everybody show. come. Thank you. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned for more City Week in just a moment.
Ladies and gentlemen, well, thank you for joining us City Week. My guests have been from the Legacy Museum, the interim director, Clark Johnson, who is also the Troop County historian. Ladies and gentlemen, he talked about a wealth of things that are taking place there at the museum, and more specifically, lifting more voices as we celebrate Black History Month during the month of February. Ladies and gentlemen, go out and take those exhibits in. Hopefully we can learn from each other and make our community a better place to live. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for joining for City Week this week. And as always, I'm going to invite you back for more of City Week.